Uh, joining me now for the hour, Kathy Jones, Charles Schwab, fi Chief, Chief Fixed Income Strategist. Also with us, uh, David Bonson of the Bonson Group, CIO and Managing uh, Partner. Guys, I had a whole lovely plan, and I'm throwing it out because we have this enormous deal. Morgan Stanley uh, buying e trade for $13 billion. Uh, David, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I uh, spent a good portion of my career at Morgan Stanley. I know the firm very well, have some of my closest friends there. And, and I can tell you it is a bit of a surprise. I think that um, Gorman is quite a deal maker. And, and this is not exactly when he got to like steal Smith Barney out of Citigroup at the bottom of the financial crisis. They spent about $2.7 billion for that unbelievably robust franchise. And now they're spending five or six times that on E-Trade, which used to run Super Bowl commercials with babies throwing money around. I mean, mm -hmm. it is so off-brand for the white shoe investment bank Morgan Stanley. Daily, I'm just stunned. Where they get like zero fees and a race to zero fees uh, to the bottom. But worse than that, because that speaks to an economic problem. Sure. I get it. Maybe that's why the stock's down three and a half percent. But what I would speak to, Alex, I'm, I'm highly confident in my view here, is the cultural problem. It, mm. Is that the clients of E-Trade are not looking for advice. So even apart from the fact they don't pay for trades, they're not looking to have intermediaries that are there to provide wealth management. The, the, the spectrum of the marketplace that is willing to pay for a more private level of asset management and financial planning is at a higher net worth level than where E-Trade is. So I think this is going to be a very diff difficult cultural merger for them. Uh, uh, Kathy, obviously, Charles Schwab is uh, buying a TD Ameritrade, so I don't want to put you in a tough spot with that. Uh, but what are your thoughts as we see sort of banks trying to be different? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a really competitive marketplace right now. You know, everyone's trying very hard to get assets. They're trying very hard to get clients. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of consolidation, especially with zero uh, fees. So it doesn't surprise me that this consolidation is taking place, and we'll probably continue to see more of it. All right. Joining us now for more on the details, Allison Williams, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Banks Analyst. Um, what do you think? Well, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty hefty price. Yes, yeah, a never a dull moment in, in financials. <laughs> um, and uh, second big deal we've seen th th this uh, week. Um, but what does it mean for, like, Goldman? Like, who's really hurt on this? Like, who's left out in the cold? Who's trying to, like, expand to this business but are late? I just can't help but think that this is bad for Goldman. Well, I think, um, you know, definitely this is consistent with Morgan Stanley's strategy. They had said, actually, on their last earnings call that they want that the next leg of their strategy was to go for the mass affluent. So, you know, Smith Barney took them in one direction and now they're sort of going further in that mm -hmm, direction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as for Goldman, Goldman has a, sort of if you look over the very long term with Goldman, they've always preferred to build versus buy. However, in their asset management business, they have been a little bit more acquisitive. But it's more, more like bolt-on acquisitions. And, and so I think that's sort of more consistent with Goldman's Got strategy. Um, but to your point, they are also looking to, I think, expand. Did, did we learn something that, like, that I was always under the impression that like a UBS and Morgan Stanley are for the high ultra net worth, the really, really rich people? Are we running out of really, really rich people? Or do they just see the need to expand their base because millennials are going to come in and buy stocks? Like, what's the thinking? So I think it, it is that, right? And so what? So UBS I, I, especially is focused on the ultra high net worth, and they're really, I would say, you know, the the, the largest global wealth manager um, with a presence, you know, so, sort of throughout. Morgan Stanley, their strength is really um, the U.S. retail franchise. They've um, really built on that, as was pointed out. Um, with the crisis, the Smith Barney acquisition. So this is just sort of moving a little bit more downscale in that direction. Yeah, David. Well, what I was going to say is that um, there's another element that I don't think people are talking about. It is, we're not running out of wealthy people, by the way, and that market is huge. And you see things like the, the Schwab TD trade. That's a custodial play on the RIA mm. space that I happen to be in, where there are hundreds of billions of dollars leaving the Morgan Stanley's, UBS's, Merrill mm. Lynch's to go to independent fiduciary firms. There is no money going from independent fiduciary firms into the Morgan Stanley's, Merrill Lynch's. So this this becomes a, a sort of different strategy. Goldman Sachs bought United Capital last year for $750 million, not $13 billion. Mm -hmm. And that was a fee-based smaller RIA that was more downscale. 
So going, putting 13 billion into an entity like E-Trade, I think has a, a really bold statement that they're willing to go very downstream, mm-hmm. but it requires a complete business reinvention relative to the culture. Remember when they bought Smith Barney, and I was a legacy Morgan Stanley guy, not Smith Barney, they thought, the Smith Barney folks thought they were going downstream by joining the old Dean Witter. Okay, so now you're talking E-Trade. I would imagine their average account size is twenty or thirty thousand dollars. That's uh, that's how that's right. how downstream we're talking so, about here. Like, well, well yeah. there's also an issue of technology here. So I'm yeah. I'm not I'm not an expert on everybody's technology, but you know more and more automated trading. If you're going to acquire somebody who's online, um, you want to make sure they have that robust technology, and it may be a quick way to acquire that. Oh, that's and I, I mean, I think both those points are sort of the leading question for Morgan Stanley, right? So what do they do with E-Trade from here? Do they integrate it? Do, what do they do with technology? Is there a different way that they serve these customers? Uh, you know, one reason why I think the Franklin, like Mason, deal has sort of reduced execution mm. risk is they said, okay, you know, we're going to, leg Mason affiliates, they've operated on their own, we're going to leave those autonomous, we're going to leave sort of that model um, in place. And so that sort of reduces the risk of outflows, which we saw with the Invesco Oppenheimer deal. And so I think, you know, to the point that this is a very different culture, it is a very different customer, you know, what are they going to do with technology? Is this, is it a sort of more of a st- technology oriented mm. strategy? That's what a lot of the um, bigger burgers have, ta- have talked about doing, um, and across wealth really talked about sort of this hybrid model of um, advice and technology. But, you know, how is Morgan Stanley going to s- serve them? You know, and then the big question for me is how do we get to this price? Yeah. How did we get to this price? That's, you know, we're waiting to see the slide presentation. We haven't seen it yet, but, But can you know, we imply that there were other bidders in it? This and is, this is a pretty healthy together? premium. I mean, that that could be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, who knows what we'll, we'll, but, we'll find out there. But it's still a pretty rich price. But I ask that because in which case, if there were other bidders, like, where would those bidders then go? Like, where else in the space can you get something like an E-Trade? Well, I mean, I think that the big players have now partnered, right? right. So we had, we had Schwab Ameritrade, and then that sort of left E-Trade as... Uh, the remaining uh, big target out there, um, which, by the way, people knew. And so that's, you know, you're paying, Morgan Stanley's paying a 31% premium after the stock has moved, after, you know, even after all the, the pricing announcements uh, that happened back in September or so. This deal could have been done five, six years ago at less than half the price, no question. So that is a good question. What are the next deals there to be done? And on the discount brokerage side, if that were the strategic asset being bought, I would argue this is kind of the end of it. There's maybe some real smaller fragmented players. But I think that it became a custodial play some time ago. That's certainly what Charles Schwab is buying in TD Ameritrade. Ameritrade had bought Scott Trade before, which was mm-hmm. the last of the big um, uh, on, discount online brokerage type entities. So I think right now the next big uh, moves of, of consolidation will take place in asset management, like we saw with the Lake Mason deal, and then continued deals around the RIA space, this private wealth management arena. That's the part that's in early innings and is largely not in public markets yet. So is that what Goldman buys? Like, that's the thing. It's what, what they've Goldman already buys? bought. They were the so first to come to in. They bought more? United Capital. $750 million was a big premium to inv- United Capital, but it was not a significant amount of money for Goldman. They certainly have the Treasury yeah. to go invest meaningfully in the space. And, and if they believe that they want to be in the higher end of the pool with customers that have a more complex need in financial planning and estate planning and, and more uh, deep end of the pool as far as their asset management, certainly the RIA world is where they would go next. And Alison, before I let you go, um, are buybacks dividends at risk here for Morgan Stanley um, on this? It, One would think so. I mean, it's a pretty big use of capital. So, I mean, I think the, the other question that has to be resolved for Morgan Stanley, right, is that on certain measures, they have tons of excess capital, but we have rules, uh, you know, coming down the road um, that could sort of, you know, make that excess look a lot slimmer. And mm-hmm. so we're going to want to hear about those final rules. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think, um, obviously, this is a pretty big use of their capital. And, and one other thing I'll just add, just because we're talking about Goldman and United Capital and, and execution. But again, when Goldman bought United Capital, and I think that was part of the transaction that, um, you know, the head of United Capital said, you know, we, we, we talked to people that Goldman had, had uh, purchased it, you know, bought some smaller players. Um, and the fact that they were going to kind of leave that 
um, as an entity and not try to absorb it into Goldman, I think that's, yes. th that's again, helpful from a cultural perspective. Yeah, I wonder, you were talking about you, Trey, the And then they thing. changed and the name of it to Goldman, Goldman about a month yeah. later. <laughs> sure, the name. Yeah. All right, what's in the name? All right, Allison, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Allison Williams of Bloomberg Intelligence, such great analysis. And Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab and David Bonson of the Bonson Group uh, will be sticking with me. Uh,